so they can watch it. So, all right. Well, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, I'm so thankful for the opportunity uh, to be together on Wednesday nights. Man, it's just so refreshing, Lord, uh, uh, to be able to sit down and have dinner together and uh, fellowship and just uh, sometimes Sunday, uh, it just seems so busy and quick. Um, so I'm thankful for the time to just sit and talk and then uh, do this study of theology, Lord. I ask you to bless everything that's going on here on campus tonight, whether it's kids ministry, youth ministry, uh, the other uh, Bible study. And Lord, I just ask that it would be fruitful and that we'd all be blessed and encouraged in our faith. Uh, may we know you better and uh, obey you more faithfully, Lord. Cleanse us of sin and uh, fill us with your spirit. May you be honored in all we say and do. And uh, bless those who are joining us remotely as well. Thank you for that opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so what I want to do uh, in, this, in this Wednesday evening class, uh, I call it Theology 101. Um, I think it'll be something that will complement uh, well what we're doing on Sunday morning and probably what you're doing a lot of your Sunday school classes as well is spending time talking about the doctrines of our faith. But tonight, I'm just going to do uh, kind of an introductory talk about this because a lot of people, uh, a lot of people get intimidated by the word theology, right? Or they think it's just kind of nerdy stuff or it doesn't really make a difference in our lives or it's just all these people who argue about finer points that nobody really cares about. There is some of that, by the way. Um, but I, I think uh, actually when we study this, it could be very enriching to our study of God's word and even our own lives. All, all theology, all good theology is practical. It changes who we are. So let me ask you first, what, what would, how would you describe theology? What is theology? The study of God's word. Okay. Mm -hmm. Big picture, yeah. We get theology from God's word. Yep. That's the right place to start. What does our culture think about when they hear that word? Okay. A lot of them are turned off. People are too busy thinking about politics. <laughs> Okay, that's yes, true here. A lot of people are too busy thinking about politics. I will say also, a lot of people are busy just not thinking at all. Yes. You know, um, we just kind of, there was a book, it was a book title years ago called Amusing Ourselves to Death, um, where we just kind of don't think about deep things. Um, too hard. Yeah, it's work. It's not physical work, mental work. Um, and, it, you know, it takes time. So there's an investment there. It takes time. You have to set other things down. Um, you have to, you know, put away the TV or the smartphone or whatever it is, uh, video games. To, you know, younger, younger generation, that's definitely a, a problem, I think, for a lot of them. They're not spending time thinking because they're just, Kind of numbing themselves and i think that's the problem that's a struggle for a lot of us you know we just you get home at the end of a long day just turn on tv or whatever and i'm not saying you know that's necessarily a bad thing i watch tv I and mean, it can be a, a fun fun thing a relaxing thing um but as christians um you know paul tells us to move on from milk right mm -hmm. to move on into the deeper things of our faith but our culture you know even Parts of Christian culture, I think, are, like I said, are intimidated by the thought of theology. Uh, stereotypically, um, like I said, it's just people people who argue about finer points, you know, the, the old, uh, back in the scholastic era, like in the Middle Ages, you know, they'd have debates like how many angels can fit on the head of a pin, you know. <laughs> you know it's like, well, that is pointless, by the way. <laughs> uh, but not all of theology is like that. Um, it's a very enriching study when it's done right. I, I have a very simple definition of theology broadly. And this is going to be actually pretty close to what Linda said a minute ago. Beliefs that people hold about spiritual things. And by the way, theology isn't necessarily 
Christian in one sense, right? Some people hold a lot of false beliefs about spiritual things. Now, good theology, faithful theology is not those things, right? It's, it's like you said, it's coming from God's word. Beliefs that people hold about spiritual things. There's a lot of overlap here, by the way, with Christian philosophy, which seeks to answer the big questions of life, right? You know, why are we here? What's the meaning of life? Those kinds of questions. There's a lot of overlap with that here. But beliefs that people hold about spiritual things. Now, this is theology, and I'm going to call this in general, because I'm going to make a distinction here between a specific type of theology. Uh, Millard Erickson, I don't have time to write this whole definition out, but in his book, which I'm using to hold the camera up right now, <laughs> sorry, Dr. Erickson, uh, his book, Christian Theology, which we actually use in my Union University master's level class on theology, a great book, uh, he calls it this. The discipline that strives to give a coherent statement of the doctrines of the Christian faith, based primarily on the scriptures, placed in the context of culture in general, worded in a contemporary idiom, meaning people can understand it, put in their own words, and related to issues of life. Now you know why I did it simple definition, right? I'll read that again. The discipline that strives to give a coherent statement of the doctrines of the Christian faith, based primarily on the scriptures, Plates in the context of culture in general, worded in a contemporary idiom and related to issues of life. Now, there's another understanding of this word theology. And we would call this theology proper. Anybody know what I mean by that? Theology proper. That's a hard, sorry. Uh, Theology proper is the study of the attributes and actions of God himself. Okay. What is our theology in a technical, specific sense? Mean? What do we believe about God? Not just spiritual things, big, big questions of life. What do we believe about God? That's theology proper. Okay. Attributes and actions of God Himself. Yeah, and you can see if you know any Greek words at all, theos and logos. See, study of God. That's where it comes from. So that's more the kind of the more strict understanding of what theology is. What do we believe about God? God is good, God is faithful, God is just. These things are theology proper. So let me ask you, who qualifies as a theologian? Everything. That's what I think it's just. Especially given my first broader definition. Do atheists have beliefs about God? Yes. Yeah. Pretty strong ones in a lot of cases. So we would disagree with their theology. We would find that it is wrong, that it's unbiblical. But everyone you encounter, not a professional theologian, but they to some degree have a theology in that broader sense. Um, so this obviously factors in then to how we do evangelism or apologetics or cross-cultural missions, right? You have to know the theology of people in Jordan, you know, so you could see where you could make bridges to the gospel or explain, well, that's actually not the truth here, or whatever it is. So this is relevant. It's not just ivory tower kind of stuff um, that's irrelevant to our lives and, and our mission. Uh, it is relevant. Uh, well, well, what's it, what are examples of, of theological beliefs? Very broad. God yeah. is love. Okay, God is love. And and even before that one, there is a God. If if God is love, then there is a God. So it, that's what I mean. It starts really, really basic. There is a God. God is love. What else? Created him. Okay, he's a creator. Yes. There, there, the, the, I mean, we could go really, really fundamental here. There is a real universe. This is not an illusion to us. <laughs> okay. Some people. Might not agree there. There is a real world. There's a creator, and, and, and it has all come from him. And so he was there before creation, right? So 
the creation entails a God who created it from the Somebody else has done. He said some people believe God eventually. Eventually, okay. Some people might hold that. Yeah. Beginning and the end. Okay. A lot of people believe everybody believes a good person goes to heaven. Yeah. Scales way in the good direction, one in the bad. That is a very commonly held theological belief. Because, oh, she, uh, Chrissy said that a lot of people believe that uh, people, it's sort of like our lives are on a scale of good and bad. And if you have your good outweighs your bad, you get to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people in our culture, yeah. and in the Bible Belt, I would say probably in particular, um, that think that that's how things work. You know, you don't, you've been, uh, probably most of you have been to quite a few funerals and memorial services. There's a general assumption that your loved one is, is in a, their loved one is in a better place. You just assume that. We had a cat die once, and the vet told us our cat was in a better place. <laughs> he was trying to comfort us, but uh, I didn't get into an argument with him at that point. That cat, he was a very good cat. So if cats are saved by works, then he made it. Richard said dogs work. So no, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, this this cat was friendly like a dog, basically. Uh, and some of them are definitely not going to have <laughs> So uh, anyway, people, yeah, that's a theological belief, I guess, to some degree, what he said to us that night. But um, yeah, that that in particular, this idea of, you know, those of you who, uh, deacons who went through the unsaved Christian book that we read, um, you know, there's a lot in there about people who just sort of think, because I'm American, and I'm not Jewish or Muslim, I must be a Christian and I'm going to heaven. I'm, I haven't killed anyone, I don't rob banks. I'm a good guy, I'm a good, I'm a decent lady or whatever. Uh, and so they have that theological belief. They wouldn't call it theological belief probably, uh, but it is, it's, it's there. Now, um, there- That's more prevalent or less than it used to be the way the world is now and with the way people think and all their different- huh. Want to be different than what? That's a great question, Bill. There was a recent article about basically it, dealing with mothers that were saying that they weren't taking their children to church and their children were doing just fine. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, so that's yeah. Out. <laughs> um, I, and it, it probably depends country to country, really. Like, for example, I have a friend who's an IMB missionary, he's been a missionary in East Berlin. You know, obviously, Bill not divided anymore, but it still has that kind of cultural side. Atheism is much more rampant there than it is here. But I still think culturally, you've probably seen a rise in that in this country. So um, even though most people are atheists, uh, I think less and less of them would think like, oh, I'm a good person, I go to heaven, because less and less of them think there is a heaven. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah, that's right. So... I think that's prevalent, what you said about Germany, all over Europe. Our, yeah. our daughter and family lived over there for three and a half years. And maybe, you know, church was just nobody went to church. Nobody went to yeah. church. But they thought they were good people and, and that they were going to heaven. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the pandemic can make that worse because everybody thinks, well, I mean, for two years we didn't go to church, we watched online, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So we're all okay. Yeah, we are we are blessed here. Um, the more that I see and read, there's a lot of churches that are not that are just really decimated. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of people come back and thankful for that. Our people are committed to attendance, and obviously we still have some folks who need to stay home for you know or you know compromise issues or whatever but i think we've had a lot better percentage come back than a lot of churches from what i'm hearing um and and with regard to europe they increasingly some of our folks with missions background may be able to speak to this but i increasingly call europe a post-christian society um they they think they're kind of past that yeah, and you're right. We're on the same road. You're on you're the same road. Yeah. You're watching going with all the Jesus family and the chaplain in their homes and nursing homes and all that. 
because the spirituality is very, very weak for most people. Yeah. There is any. And there's all this idea, you know, okay, he was good, he's yeah. a nice person, so he's going to be in a better place, but they don't ever talk about what that better place is. Yeah. So, and definitely there's no this is a bad this is a bad person, so we know where he's going. Never, <laughs> never, 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 right. Never heard much of that. Right. Can you all hear Philip? Those of you who are on the Zoom. Okay, great. I wondered how sensitive the microphone was. We've got Rex Holloway. Rex and is Donna there with you, Rex? I think he is. Okay. We got Rex and Donna Holloway, Terry Langston, and Jane Vicky Water with us. I'm sorry it's not working up there, but um yeah, that's uh it's also interesting because I think even in America, there seems to be a strong sense of like general vague spirituality without like uh, rigorous theology, especially without Christianity. You know, so people say, I'm, I'm a spiritual but not religious. They'll say phrases like that. That's widespread today. Um, and they might mean like, crystals and weird stuff like that you know like when they say spiritual um so it's yeah that when someone tells you i'm very spiritual you got to ask more questions <laughs> you know to so kind of diagnose where they are in terms of the relationship with jesus um well then the whole thought that because they are they, they are americans yeah. you know obviously god's been if there is a god he's going to say them because we're americans yeah. That's very funny. Yeah. They're the good guys. Exactly. Yeah. And all those other countries are okay, but we're Americans, so of course, of course, we are the blessed favored nation. Yeah. But even here in the walk over the Bible belt, what percentage of the population is in the church on the Sunday? Forgetting the last two years, but we right. were left. Probably 10% of the left, probably around 10%, maybe 15. So it's not a massive, we have a yep. lot of church members, we have a lot of people who have some sort of church affiliation, but active participants, it's a very, it's right. not a big percentage. Yeah. So our theology is very skewed and very uh, shaky. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about that, I mean, also, we have many church that the church called us about to feed the children. Mm -hmm. They think it's more of something social. You know, it's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And they, <laughs> so the kids can come just to play. The, the little can come just to have fellowship, to play. So we learn little by little. The church is called yeah. us about to play. More of a social club. Yes. Yeah. And obviously, there's social aspect. We just had a fellowship dinner, yeah. and that's a key, a really key aspect of what it means to be a Christian and part of a church. But we're making disciples, right? People who hold to God's truth, who are changed by the truth of God. That's a good point. Yeah. Do you have any other perspective from Brazil on this? Okay. Well, no, we, we face the same thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now about theology, we, we gave several different examples of theological beliefs. There's a lot of theological categories, some of which you may know, um, that we have to talk about as well. You may not know that there's some fancy terms for them uh, that we don't really need to spend a lot of time on that, but uh, does anybody know any category of theology? It's like subcategories. You know what the... Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> I say something, Rex. No, no. Hey, no, what our doctrine of, of who Jesus is, is called. It has his name in the title. Jesus so, it's Christology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like our doctrine of Christ is Christology. Our doctrine of the Holy Spirit. One comes from a Greek word. It's not pneumonia. <laughs> it's although those, those, the, the Greek words are related there. Uh, it's pneuma, a P N, which means like wind or, or breath. Um, 
So you can see with actually similar in Hebrew, the word for the Holy Spirit is, is wind, which is breath. Uh, pneumatology, the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to write all these down. You may have heard of eschatology. Who knows what eschatology is? Nature. End times. End times. Because eschaton, Greek means end. Uh, salvation. Soteriology, yes, Anderson. Our doctrine of salvation is soteriology. I should know what the root there is, but I don't. Um, so there's a lot of these. Um, uh, doctrine of sin is homartiology. Uh, there's there's all these different categories. You know the doctrine of man, anthropology, right? So we're familiar with that term. So there's all these different categories. Part of the reason I bring them up is because I think there's a pretty natural progression through them that we'll do, uh, that we'll kind of follow in our class. And actually, Dr. Allison, I, this reference uh, is at the very end of your notes. It, you don't have to get this at all. But if you want a book to kind of walk through with us, Dr. Allison's at my seminary, Greg Allison. Chris, you guys know his wife pretty well. She's a wonderful uh, couple. This is called 50 Core Truths of the Christian Faith. And it's not, you can see it's a lot thinner than some of the other books on theology. I think it's a lot more palatable. Yeah, online, I guess. yeah you can get, I got it on Amazon, you know. Um, but yeah, there, it's probably a Kindle version too, if that's what you mean. But so he, in his contents here, he follows uh, a progression that I think is important. I'm going to explain it to you. First, he does the doctrine of the word of God. Why do you think? Don't you think, oh, we should start with the doctrine of God, or salvation, or something like that? Why should we start with the doctrine of the word? What's that? Yeah. How do we know any of the rest of this? It's a building block. It's a building block, right? That's the source. Like you said at the beginning, Harry, we studying God's word. That's theology. Uh, and so that's the first thing we'll do. And I, I, I may spend more than, I'll probably spend more than one night on that. But we'll start there next week. The doctrine of the word of God. What do we believe? I actually touched on that this past Sunday, talking about six things we believe about scripture. So how do we do any of the rest of this? Well, we start with God's word because that's, that's where we know the way. The next one would be the doctrine of God himself, theology proper. And I said, what do we believe about God? What are his characteristics? Followed by the doctrine of, what do you think next? Creation, God's creatures. All right, that would include anthropology. That would include what we believe about man. You can see, by the way, I want you to notice this: how we're moving towards the gospel. Right? We start with the word because that's how we know it. We start with God, who He is. He's the Creator. We're moving towards Him creating us, and we're going to get to our need for salvation, and and then how He makes the church, and you know, establishes. So his redeemed people. You see a progression here? I think this is the best way to study this. Um, so being a, if you believe in the Big Bang Theory, is that, is that a different kind of theology than someone else that would argue with you about the Big Bang Theory? But there was a show on TV the other night that had the whole thing about the Big Bang Theory and how it worked. I didn't watch so, it. I'm going to say something, but I hope people don't start throwing things at me. I actually think the Big Bang doctrine can fit really well with the Bible. But I'm glad, I'm glad you and me and Mark are on the same page. Yeah, uh, because there's a lot of scientific evidence to, that points to everything having originated at one point. I think that fits pretty well with God having said, let there be light. Boom. Expands. Yeah, it's not random chance or evolution like they'll say where it's completely unguided. It's not that at all. But I think God may have done it just like that. So I don't know if that answers your question. It is. But yeah. Um, it's very hard to accept people who are so narrow minded that they think the earth is only 6,000 years old when science has proven that it, it's millions yeah. of years old. And so, you know, you get these arguments. But. Yeah. I think. Um, uh, I addressed this when I talked about Genesis. I think it's my second message in Genesis because I think you can, I think you can hold to a faithful understanding of Scripture, and you can come to an old Earth position. I think there's room for coming to a young Earth position too, um, and 
and that's some that's not something we have to argue and be angry at each other about. There are some organizations out there that are doing that, and Christian organizations, but it's very frustrating. We got enough of a fight on our hands with the devil. It's hard, it's hard to comprehend the immense of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. So doctrine of creation, the doctrine of Christ, God the Son. You could say God the Father, or God the Father, God the Son. Doctrine of the, it's going to say Spirit here. Doctrine of salvation. A lot of disagreement there. Well, doctrine of the church. Anybody know what this is called? I might know this one. Ecclesiology. That's our doctrine of the church. That would include things like church government, which is obviously something people widely disagree on too, and that's okay. I, I don't think the Bible really strictly spells it out. Um, and then finally, let's just, uh, let's just say, uh, I'll say hang on. We could say eschatology, we could say final states, we could say future things. I love this progression because I think it makes sense in terms of understanding Starting with the word is our basis, understanding who God is, how we've been made, how we've been rescued by Christ. Of course, this is easy to start getting into salvation too, but you know, who Jesus is, who, who the Spirit is, finishing out the Trinity, and our salvation, God making, like when He saves us, He makes us part of the church, doctrine of the church, and then how everything's going to change. So that's kind of the progression. I think it's important to understand why we go that way. So we've already touched on this. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, now, well, so what we're going to be doing in here, you could call it systematic theology. What I mean by that is the study of individual doctrines of the Christian faith based on a comprehensive observation of those doctrines in all of the scripture. So in systematic theology, you start with one of these categories or an individual belief within them. Um, so um, let's say uh, God is eternal. Uh, the eternal nature of God. Uh, and we look at all of scripture to say, what does the whole Bible say about that doctrine? That's one way of approaching it. But there's another kind of theology called biblical theology that approaches it differently. Biblical theology, anybody know, know what I mean when I say biblical theology? Okay, biblical theology, and this is my definition, the study of the Bible and its individual books for the goal of understanding the big picture of the Bible and the emphases of each book, as well as how those emphases fit in the big picture. That's a, that's a mouthful, but here's the point. When you're doing biblical theology, you might look, like, so we're first and second Thessalonians. You look at those books and say, what is the main teaching of those books? What are the things that are emphasized in those books? And how does what we're learning in first Thessalonians fit into the whole picture? You see how it's different from systematic theology? Systematic theology, you're just picking a topic, right? There's, uh, you know, salvation, Holy Spirit. What does the Bible tell us? All, all it tells us about the Holy Spirit. How do we distill that down and come to a set of beliefs about the Holy Spirit based on all of Scripture? Biblical theology says, what do we learn from Micah? What's the main emphasis of that book? And how does it fit into the arc of Scripture? Like the, the story that God is telling Okay, does that make sense? That's the distinction between those two. So we already talked about this some. Where do I where do we get our theology? The source is God's word. Um, and I mentioned on Sunday, the Holy Spirit is the one who opens our eyes uh, to the truth of God's word. <clears throat> so let me ask you this. Uh, what's an example? Uh, we already talked about cultural Christianity. Uh, what's another example of false theology that is widespread? No hell. No hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many many believe that, but there's there's no hell. But like I said, everybody. Those it's funny because even those who think that good people go to heaven, you know, they they kind of, or, or or even people that assume like everybody goes to heaven, they kind of want to make an exception for like Hitler, right? Well, he can't do that. I was like, well, then where where do we draw the line? That's the question. Who draws the line? And who draws the line? It's a great way to put it, 
right? So right away, we're getting into the question of theology and what's the source of truth on this? That was one of the questions one of the books Richard went through the shack. Uh -huh. and they were talking to him. That was one of the questions. Where did you draw the line? Why is that person good enough, bad enough? To yeah. History? Yeah, and, and pretty quickly you realize it's, for us, it's arbitrary. Yeah. I didn't like that guy, you know? Or you know, all of history can agree on Hitler, but what about you know somebody whose record is a little more mixed? You know. <laughs> well, that the issue there even is questionable now because there's a college professor that did a, a survey of his students. Yeah. Come to find out that none of them, no one would condemn Hitler to say that his beliefs and what he did was wrong because they were judging somebody. Right. Well, we said consistent, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then, uh, I mean, it's good to, to do stuff like this and, and to talk about how it's based in scripture because we realize that without scripture, without thinking through these things, we are anchorless. You know, we're just adrift. Um, well, like Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you know, the person whose life will last is the one, you know, built on the truth of what I've said, you know, they're going to weather the storms. They're going to have an anchor, so to speak, you know, if I can get through all that the world's going to throw to you. Yeah. Along with his, I think it's, there's no absolutes. There's nothing that's completely, well, it's completely right, and there's nothing that's completely wrong. It's all, depends on who you are and where you are, and yeah, you know, whether you're white or black or you live in Africa or live in Canada or South America, whatever it is, all it's so if you can't it goes back to you can't be on stretch. But there's no actually right. Yeah. yeah, along the same line, a lot of people think that we can all just happily coexist and everybody's kind of on the right path and Muslims are kind of their God is similar and you know, everybody's just kind of, we can all be, mm -hmm. we're all kind of on the path. We, we call it different things. Yeah. That's where a lot of people say. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really good example of this, like false theology that is widespread. I saw a clip years ago uh, where Oprah, you think about her influence within our culture. Um, and I think she might even, if you asked her, she might say she was a Christian. I know that. I think she used to claim that. She did. Yeah. But I saw a video clip, her own lips. She was somebody who was, I don't know, it was on her normal show or some, some other special or whatever. But somebody in her audience was saying, Jesus is the only way. Somebody's really being bold in her audience and saying, there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. And Oprah looked at her and said, that cannot possibly be true. Mm -hmm. You know, like can that did, she literally thought it was logically impossible that there would only be one way. Um, I feel like a lot of people believe this and have said this to us that you know what right did we have to be missionaries to go to another country yeah. and tell them yeah. because what kind of God would condemn an entire people because they didn't know? And it's something that I think most missionaries, unless you're incredibly arrogant, you struggle with because it is painful to think yeah. that that had happened because then it puts the responsibility right on us. Mm -hmm. And and I I believe that they don't have to believe our American version of it because whether we like it or not, we have Americanized the gospel. Yeah, every the culture truth, contextual. The truth yeah. of the gospel is the same, and, and God makes Himself yeah. known through various ways, but. That's just a very difficult thing to believe because if you truly believe it, you get so burdened sometimes you can't hardly get out of bed each day. And so you don't want to believe that because it's yeah. just excruciating. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody know what this belief we've talked about that all roads lead to God? Does anybody know what that is called? Well, religious pluralism. Religious pluralism. I know it was on the tip of your tongue, though. It was <laughs> <laughs> religious pluralism, and it is very widespread. Um, and I, I mentioned this on Sunday or somewhere else, but um, it, you know, from like a philosophical, logical standpoint, it literally is self defeating because uh, 
some religions aren't even trying to get to heaven. <laughs> you know, they don't think there is a heaven. You're saying, well, you got to cease desire. You know, you reach nirvana, you just, you know, kind of stop wanting things. Um, and then you're happy or something, which doesn't really make sense to me. Am I supposed to desire that at the end? Because how do I not desire it and still desire it? You know, um, uh, there are some religions that have a personal God that that's in heaven, that makes heaven heaven, like ours, our religion. But there's some that deny that there's a personal God at all. It's just some kind of force or karma or whatever. Um, and so it can't logically it cannot possibly be true that all of them would get to the same point because they're not even talking about the same point and they have explicit logical contradictions between them some will say there is a god others say there is not a god it cannot possibly be true that both of those statements would be true or the whole thing breaks down um or even our ability to communicate breaks down once we remove the laws of logic from oh, multiple gods. yeah so one God, no God, multiple God, it literally cannot all be true. Um, and so, but, but again, people don't like to think about hard things. That's, that's what you went back to the Lord Richard said first. If it's hard, I don't want to think about it. Yeah. I'm going to take the easiest path. Uh, and, and that, and, you know, nobody wants to argue about religion with somebody else if they can help you. Yeah. Because they get the feelings, you get the feelings, you, you don't know where it's going. Yeah. Uh, it's, and I may have said this on Sunday as well, but I think, uh, one of the things that people don't like to say is that Christianity is exclusive. The exclusivity of Christ means he is the only way um, because that feels, you know, judgmental because mm -hmm. um, you're then saying, you know, others' ways are not true. In fact, uh, my, my PhD supervisor, Dr. Mark Coppinger, used to be president of one of um, the, our Southern Baptist seminaries. He, years ago, he worked for the SBC Executive Committee and um, he went, I think it was John F. And went on and they wanted to you know string him up he went on donahue and and the question it was in line of something somebody had said i can't remember i, I forgive me for not remembering the details but there's somebody had said something about it was about us evangelizing jews sort of sort of this thing that, that you were talking about like who gives you the right you know to to claim that if they don't receive Christ, they're going to hell. And especially within our culture and all the history in the world of anti-Semitism, in particular, they would um, kind of focus on that and say, well, wait, you're saying those Jews are going to hell. They believe in God. They believe in the Old Testament, you know. Um, and so Dr. Coppinger went on the show, and, and there have been the people who are very angry. And he said he, the Lord gave him a statement in that moment that really kind of diffused a lot of it. And he said, we as a Southern Baptist, we just believe um, it's much better if you're lost that someone is coming and looking for you, um, that, that we care enough to go and tell. You know, we're not happy about it. You know, we don't want people, we're not desiring of that. We believe everyone's lost, not just Jews. Everyone who re rejects Christ is headed for eternity apart from God and the judgment that we actually all deserve. And that we brought on ourselves because of sin. And he said, we just believe that it's our calling to go and seek those people. Just like Jesus came to seek and save the lost, you know. Um, so uh, that that idea of religious pluralism is very widespread. Um, and you'll deal with it the more people you talk to. Um, and so you have to be ready to stand on the truth. And so we, we start getting into apologetics pretty quick, but they're very closely related to evangelism and theology. Apologetics are all kind of together. So I, I may have answered this to some degree, but why why do you why would you say theology is a valuable pursuit? What's valuable about this kind of study? They know what you believe and why you believe it <laughs> based on looking at scripture. I mean the best the best books on theology will present sort of like multiple sides of a debated issue. And then argue for and, and present those sides faithfully, not caricaturing them, not straw men, right? But then saying, because of the evidence of scripture, this is why I come to this belief, right? So know what you believe, know why you believe it. Well, that's the hardest part of being able to say what you what you believe, be able to put it out in a coherent form when yeah. you're talking to someone. Yeah. That's the hardest part. It makes you a better witness. Yeah. Yeah. 
That is, I, that is, I think, one of the most important reasons we should do this kind of stuff. Uh, and you don't have to, you know, be a seminary graduate to share the gospel faithfully. Most people are not, obviously, um, and God has called us all to his mission. So, um, yeah. And, and the other thing, Billy, about that is you have to be able to put it in terms that the person who has zero church experience can understand. That's not easy, right? The better teachers are the ones who can explain it for little kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? Put a difficult concept into, into words that the simplest person could understand. I don't mean simple in a derogatory way. Just, um, it's, it's easier to just explain things in a way that goes over people's head. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and sometimes those of us who have lived, been in, lived in church, that's what I like to call it, uh, who have been in church their whole lives, we can explain things. We start using the term, oh, just washed in the blood, brother. And like, what? You know? <laughs> you know, what do we mean by that? Um, so yeah, that's that's an that's an important point though. I would to me you just said it helps me in my understanding of my relationship with the creator of the universe. God who loves me and is back to even my relationship with him and that through that relationship and that affects everything else in my life, or it should, but not only do it. So you're saying there's devotional value to this, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's worship. It's theology. Is, it's, you know, I studied all those classes. You, you know, no, it's not you talking about. I hadn't thought about many of them. <laughs> but yeah, if you don't uh, put it into a practical relationship with who God is, yeah, then it's just a bunch of facts and things in your head that make no impact on you or anybody else. Yeah, probably one of the most exciting books that I've read was The Cross of Christ by John Stott. Yeah. Anybody read that book? Uh, the Cross of Christ by John Stott is probably 30 years old or more now. Um, it's a kind of a modern classic on the crucifixion of Jesus and his atonement. And it is not an easy read, but man, you just thrill your heart. You know, with the joy of understanding more deeply what Jesus has done for us. Yeah, that's, I'm so glad you said that. Though. Good, faithful theology leads to worship, not just uh, not just the other things we've mentioned and being able to explain things and know why you believe and stand against you know false beliefs, but it should, it should lift our heart up. Terry. I heard a statement this week that the church that the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years. From people in different countries, and they all had the same concept, even though they weren't in the same place. Do you know about that? Yeah, I said that on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Whoever said that's a genius. <laughs> you were awake. Right. Thank you for listening, Eric. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I thought it was somebody important. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, that's where you were saying. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's about 1,500 years, and I, I didn't say this on Sunday because I, I'm not 100 sure if it's true, but I, I read years ago somebody said that it was written on three different continents. Mm -hmm. uh, Something like that. Different because they're all kind of close, you know. That that they all came together world. with the same concept. Yeah, and 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 one of the things I pointed out on Sunday, and I'll say again now, is that. You will see differences of perspective, in particular, if you look at the four Gospels. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, like some of them, it's, oh, the rooster crowed, crowed twice, the rooster crowed once. Well, those aren't mutually exclusive. He didn't say he only crowed once and not twice. He just said, it's a crow, like whether he did it a couple times or not. You know, some people will try to look at the Bible and hold it to a higher standard than they hold their own lives in terms of telling the story because they come at it with a presupposition of believing it's not true. You know, looking for evidence of that. So you will see differences of perspective, but total agreement uh, in terms of the, the truth of what's being taught. Has anybody seen this as a movie came out 10, 15 years ago? Anybody seen the movie Vantage Point? Yeah. It had Dennis Quaid in it. Yeah. It's, it's, this, it's a fascinating, as I was watching, I kept thinking about the gospel, the four gospels. It's a story of, I think it's an attempted assassination mm -hmm. on a president. I don't think the president. 
which is actually shot it's in Europe or something. Um, and they tell the story, I don't know, six, eight times. Mm -hmm. Like, so yeah, yeah, so like all the different people who are living this very intense experience. And it, you watch it and you're like, that looks totally different from person three or five. That looks totally different. And then at the end, you see all the stories fit. It's just, it, it's different from, like I said, from different people's perspective of the event. And so I think uh, the gospels are the same way. That, and then, of course, I think the movie is even more kind of divergent yeah. than we would say reading the gospel accounts in terms of what it looks like. Um, but uh, apologetics uh, authors will say that actually the, the different perspectives in the gospels, where at first you read, like, oh, does that fit? It actually strengthens the case. Maybe I can get some attorney help here. But like, if, if every single witness to Jesus' life stated everything the same way throughout the same exact way then it would be it would feel it would look like they had been coached as witnesses to his life but since they present them not contradictory contradictory but from different perspectives it's actually a stronger total case that makes sense that's one of the real arguments for the reliability of not only the gospel but of the bible as a whole um, that not only does it fit with the, itself or with all those different authors, but that there's slight differences of perspective of the same events that still, you know, corroborate each other, um, but show them from different angles, show the, the same event and the same life from different angles. Uh, that's a strong argument for reliability of scripture. So, okay, um, last thing I want to do. Um, is is this? Let me ask you just this question: Are there levels of importance in our theolo theological beliefs? Are there some theological beliefs that are of, of a higher order or higher importance than others? Yes or no? <laughs> I think the answer is clearly yes. Do you, can you think of an example of one that might be of the highest order? Jesus okay. Yes. Yes. And and it, as part of that, you know, who Jesus is, mm -hmm. right? Because that's essential to it. So, so Christology is of the highest order. Because I mean, in the early church, the arguments over what was heresy and what wasn't often centered on its beliefs about Jesus. Was he fully man or not? Some people thought he wasn't. Was he full of God or not? A lot of people thought he wasn't. Um, that was a big issue in the early church, sorting out what do we believe about Christ, and that's a top tier issue. What would you say might be a lower tier issue? Mm -hmm. That I think is a great example. In time, do we, I think I said this on Sunday too. Do we have to agree on the details of how we interpret Revelation, no. and and I think it's actually good that we would have diversity within our church on that issue. Um, there's good and faithful biblical scholars all over the map on that book in particular who hold to a right understanding of scripture itself, um, but come out very differently in terms of their interpretation of that book. Um, Dr. Albert Moeller, who's the president of my seminary that I went to, he has a term that I think is really helpful for this. I put it in your notes. He calls it theological triage. You know what triage is when you go to the ER? You know, mm -hmm. Right, that first person. It makes you think you're going to go back and then you got to wait a lot longer, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, that person is there to figure out how serious your issue is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've got, you know, like a certain type of problem, if you're showing symptoms of a heart attack, obviously they're going to rush you in. If you've got a broken arm, that's painful, but it's not life-threatening. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, especially in these days, they're kind of rationing their resources, the time of their doctors, uh, and the seriousness of, of, of the situations that the patients have. We can do a similar thing with theology. Uh, and as we look at issues in scripture or talk about some of these different doctrines, it's good that we would think through, and we don't necessarily have to like categorize a one, two, three level, you know, we don't have to flesh it out that much, but it's good to think about where is this in terms of importance? Is this a first order importance? Is this like a heart attack? <laughs> You know, or is this like a you know a sprained ankle and it's lower level importance? So you gave examples like Christology, our soteriology, our doctrine of salvation, 
those are top, top tier. Because those decide whether you're a Christian or not, <laughs> right? And scripture says, you deny that Jesus is the son of God, you're not a Christian, right? Um, you don't repent and believe, you're not, you have not received Christ. Um, but eschatology, our study of the end, our understanding of the end times, um, in, in my mind, there's kind of a loose, and I, we don't, like I said, we don't have to go through and put all these in this category, but in my mind, there's sort of a first, second, and third order. That's how I flesh this out. First order is the things I've just mentioned, Dr. Jesus, salvation, those kind of things. Second order for me would be things that like I would divide with someone, not saying they're not a Christian, but I wouldn't go to their church or allow them to be a member of my church as a pastor. So for example, I got great friends who are like Methodists, conservative. I have a great conservative Methodist friend in Florida. We still stay in touch. We were, yeah. <laughs> You're a friend too, so we're good. <laughs> uh, I was a man. Yeah, we got we got a lot of folks in our church that have that as a background. Um, and this guy, I was pastor of First Baptist Evening. He was First United Methodist this evening. We were catty cornered. They had adopted from China. We had a lot of similarities in adoption. Awesome family. Um, only problem is he's a Man City fan. So, uh, but uh, man, uh, but uh, we we got along great. Huh? Better than Liverpool. Oh no. <laughs> so. Anyway, soccer, sorry, soccer joke. Um, I'm glad someone in the room followed me there. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I love that guy. I, I, I would trust him. You know, I'm closer to him than even a lot of friends of mine who would be with me on all, you know, all three tiers or whatever in my mind. But he's not going to be a member of my church. You know, uh, and I, I wouldn't expect him to allow me to be a member of this church. Um, we differ on a pretty important issue, and that's baptism. Baptism top tier? No. Uh, but it's pretty important, <laughs> right? We're at Baptist church, and so our understanding of that uh, is of a high level, but not the highest level, um, because we understand baptism doesn't save us. It's an outward sign of what the Lord has already done in our hearts when we repent and believe in Christ. But um, it's as we flesh out trying to be the most biblical church we can, we understand baptism as, as something that regenerate people engage in. Someone who has understood the gospel for themselves and become saved. That's a regenerate. They have new life in them because of the gospel. Babies can't do that. There's not a single baby baptized in all of scripture. And so um, it, it's, it's not something I'm angry at them about. <laughs> like I said, you know, I, I had good, strong relationships, and we would do stuff together within our city. You know what I mean? Um, but there's a distinction there in terms of being part of each other's churches. Um, that's that for me. Baptism is like a second tier issue. Third tier issue would be things like you know, understanding the end times, um, church government, uh, you know, or elders or deacons or committees or pastors, all, all these and mixes of all of those. You know, that is something that we can disagree on. And in fact, individual churches will change their position on over time as they change their model on, things like that. Um, that's a lower tier issue. So um, I think that's important so that we don't turn everything into a, like a hard line in the sand. There's a lot of that today. <laughs> People just dividing each other over lower tier issues. And in my world, our pastoral world, is people treating each other like heretics. Just because they disagree on these lower tier issues, we don't need to do that. Um, heretic is someone who, not just someone who disagrees with you, <laughs> there's someone who disagrees with the top tier fundamental issues of the Christian faith. That's what that's what heresy is. Not they just disagree on some interpretation of it. So uh, I think this can help us be more unified <laughs> uh, because we're not dividing over every little thing. Does that make sense? Theological triage. Mm -hmm. Um, so, any uh, particular questions that y'all have? Like I said earlier, I'm hoping this study will be a nice complement to what we do on Sunday mornings as we're walking through books of scripture. This will help kind of distill some of those things into understanding, well, what do we believe about Jesus? What do we believe about the Holy Spirit? And so on. Okay? Any questions? Anybody in Zoom land got anything?
All right, thanks for watching. Let, let, let me pray and we'll go. Father, thank you for our time together. Uh, may you bless the study that we're going to do on Wednesday nights. Uh, we pray for Jerison and Denise that you bless their trip, bring great fruit from it, help them to be a blessing to the pastors and pastors' wives there in the Amazon. Uh, thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Have a great night.